This is one of the most intense stories I have told on this channel. Gary and his friends were exploring a cave when the floods hit the town they were located in. They were in the worst possible place when the floods hit. This is the true story of the 1993 Cliff Park disaster. For this video, viewer discretion is strongly advised. Water poured from the mouth of the cave and rushed down toward the Mississippi. Gary clambered onto the ledge and out of the flash floods torrent. There is just enough space between the ledge and the fast flowing powerful water current to keep him safe. He could feel the water splashing onto him but continued to hold on for dear life in the pitch black cold cave. While climbing onto the ledge, the water thrashed and washed people's bodies down the cave right by Gary. More than once, a floating body hit upon Gary while he was on the ledge. Cascading rain sheets forced more than 500 people to be evacuated from the towns along the Missouri and Nishnabotna rivers. Authorities said the park had been closed and barricaded for two weeks because of flooding from the adjacent Mississippi River. The park had barricades up on the road leading to the mouth of the cave, a major attraction for the park with a warning that said road closed and no one was to enter this park. Rescuers would put themselves in extreme danger and risk their own lives if they were to attempt a rescue in this particular flooded cave. In a conflicting report, Joseph Buckley, the executive director of the St. Joseph's Home for Boys, took issue with those who said that the park had been closed and barricaded. He actually did not believe this. In a prepared statement, Buckley said no signs at the park were indicated that it was actually closed. He said the boys from the home had visited the park almost every day last week and they were never warned about the cave or ever told to leave. Matt Marciano of St. Louis, a veteran cave explorer who had volunteered his services, went home after his first attempt at rescuing, but he could not sleep. He said he tossed and turned in bed and kept asking himself, what did we miss? What could we be doing differently to help save people? It was a nightmare situation. Gary is one of the five boys and two adult counselors, Daryl Redmond, who's 31, and Jennifer Ether, 21, from the St. Joseph's Home for Boys who wanted to explore the Cliff Cave in Cliff Cave Park. She heard about it from her friends and she thought it would be a great thing for her to bring the boys to. Darnell listened to anything that Jennifer said because they were great friends and this would be an adventure for them. Juvenile authorities sent Gary to the boys' home just about two months ago, and that's when he first met Darnell and Jennifer. He really liked them and he trusted them, which was rare for most of the people in Gary's life. Gary's friends were wards of the state. Emmett, who was nine, Terrell and Melvin, who were 10, and Terrell was 12. A ward is a minor or incapacitated adult placed under the protection of a legal guardian or government entity, such as a court. These people can be referenced as a ward of the state. They were entered into the boys' home under these circumstances. Ruth Marr is Gary's great-grandmother, and she thought that going to the boy home was the best thing for Gary. He's only 13 years old, but he had problems with himself. He was dealing with a lot of the wrong people, and he would actually frequently run away from home. Things were just not going his way in life, and he needed to get back on track. Even though he is new, he is one of the most popular kids in the home. He's very charismatic, and he also hopes that good things will happen to him later in life, which is not common for most of the people in the home. As a result, some of the other kids in the home actually look up to Gary as sort of an older brother. On the trip to the cave, in this particular adventure, Gary was the oldest of the group and was kind of the leader of the trip. Even though there was the two counselors, everybody was really interested in what Gary thought and what Gary wanted to do. He had never been cave exploring before, but he was really looking forward to experiencing the thrill of something new that was challenging and a bit scary for him. The counselors heard about the cave and thought it would be an excellent opportunity for bonding between the boys. Most of the boys had been mistreated and emotionally troubled, so they were really just trying to get through life, and this was making it hard for them to have a good childhood. This was going to be a great day for them, and a lasting memory that they can always have. 
Visiting the cave would be a pleasant break from the day-to-day -day reality of the boys' home and their challenging lives. On Friday, July 25th, 1993, the group arrived at the Cliff Cave Park at 10 a.m. They hung around the park, just kind of looking around, and this is a, a typical hangout spot, but they don't normally go in the cave. There was a large group of boys in this park from the home. Some of them wanted to go in the cave, some of them didn't. It was kind of scary and unknown, so just a small group decided to go. This group consisted of Gary, his four friends, and the two counselors. Gary really didn't want to stay with the kids who weren't interested in exploring and adventuring, so he stuck with his small group and they entered the cave. The counselors didn't know this then, but a torrent of rain sent a deluge of water down its sides early in the morning. Much of the water poured through the holes in the cave ceilings, and it caused a lot of pooling within the cave. Nothing was different this time than any other time the counselors had visited this cave. They had been there before, and were used to it being a wet cave with visible water moving throughout it. The water was really not a big deal at the entrance of the cave. But as they got a little deeper into the cave, the water started to become more profound, and the water level was visibly starting to rise. As they were moving in, the water was up to their ankles. This still seemed normal, but the difference this time was that there was more movement in the water. It was moving fast and had debris, which was causing it to be more murky. As they got further and further down the cave, some of the kids started to yell that the water was getting really high. One second, they were happy to be exploring and the rush of something new was hitting the group, but that quickly turned into panic once reality set in. Suddenly, there was a loud sound of water rushing, and before they could turn around to exit the cave, water swept them off their feet. Gary saw everybody in panic and remembered that his sister always said, whenever you're in a danger swimming, do not panic. It came so fast, everybody got pushed under the water, and screams filled the cave. He heard one of his friends yell that he was too young to die. The sound of the water was muffling each group member's screams as they were in extreme terror. When Gary got pushed under, he held his breath and waited. He came up, got air, and then went back down under the water. He was bobbing up and down, trying to get as much air as possible. He kept going up and down and saw the other kids doing the same thing. This was kind of a natural instinct and the only way they were going to survive at this moment. They had to do this or they would drown. The water was extremely strong and the boys were soon running out of energy. They were also starting to go into shock. This was absolutely terrifying and they could not combat the situation they suddenly found themselves in. Gary started feeling around for something to grab. His fingers felt a groove in the cave wall and he grabbed a hold of a rock sticking out and pulled himself up. His head was at the top of the cave and only his chin was out of the water. It was about a 24 to 36 inch space between the shelf and the ceiling. His life flashed before his eyes as he positioned himself not to be sucked into the torrent of water rushing next to him. At this point, he had some cuts on his arm and his head from objects in the water hitting him. As this whole process was going down, he actually inhaled a bunch of water and was now coughing it up. Gary used all of his energy to pull himself up onto that ledge. If the water continued to rise, he would not be able to fight it, so he had to get up there. Again, he thought about not panicking, remembering what his sister said, and tears started to run down his face as he realized he didn't see any of his friends or the counselors that entered the cave with him. The water had taken all of them. Gary could barely see in front of his face. The room was fed by the flood in a nearby natural spring. The water temperature at this point was less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. Gary was twisted around holding onto his ledge and felt something hit him on the back. It was like a dead piece of wood, but Gary wasn't sure what it was. He soon realized it was one of his friend's lifeless bodies floating down the cave. It took him some time to actually process that this was a corpse and it just butted up next to him. He saw his friend's arms slowly disappear as the water sucked it back into the pitch black. It was such a shock seeing all of his friends gone. He was all alone and holding on for dear life. 
Gary then thought about the fact that he just watched all of his friends die. When things could not get any worse, another corpse hit Gary on the back and almost knocked him off the ledge this time. He quickly got up and repositioned himself and the corpse slowly slid alongside him back into the pitch black. He clung to the ledge all night long in the cold cave where he could no longer see even one foot in front of him. He began to think about his mom and grandmother. They loved him and they cared about him so much. He promised himself that if he could get out of this situation, he would do better, and never run away from home again, and make the most out of his life. When Ruth Marr, Gary's 85-year-old grandmother, heard Gary might still be alive in the cave, all she could do was pray. She stayed up the entire night praying that Gary would survive this disastrous ordeal. It was absolutely horrifying for her to know that her grandson could potentially die, along with others. The kids who were still outside of the cave in the park realized that it was flooded and they alerted the boys home who then alerted the authorities that a group of five boys and two counselors entered the cave at noon but never came out. Soon after that, rescuers entered the cave sometime after 6 p.m. Gary was still on his ledge and heard rescuers and voices nearby. He eagerly waited for them to save him. By this point, he was in total shock and felt stuck in this never-ending nightmare. He saw the rescuers' flashlights on the cave ceiling and screamed for bloody murder for them to save him. Unfortunately, they did not hear him. Gary then accepted his fate that he would not be rescued. He was still alive because he found a new position that required no energy to be in, where he was propped up with his feet and his toes along the edge of the ledge to keep himself from tumbling off and into the water below. If at any moment he had any sort of lapse in judgment, he would simply fall into the water and be swept away. The next day was Saturday, and at 9 a.m., cave rescuers Matt Marciano and Rich Shelper arrived at the cave along with 25 sheriff deputies, paramedics, and other cave experts. Matt and Rich then entered the cave. The water flowing through it was freezing cold, and while rescuers were working their way down the cave, one of the deputies that was there to help was taken away because he actually got hypothermia. The rescue was extremely dangerous because of the water temperature, the fact that the water was still moving, there was tight spaces you could get stuck in, and there was also a lack of good lighting. Despite the dangers, Matt and Rich kept searching. They were totally determined to find everyone in there. They entered every recess and offshoot of the cave. These guys were incredible. They were dead set on making this a successful rescue mission. They were calling out to anyone who might still be alive. The rescue plan was to explore everything and not stop until they found the living survivors. Shortly after 10 a.m., they found a small offshoot of the cave that narrowed sharply. They heard a faint noise, but were unsure if it was some sort of animal or something else. They began to think it was just another rescuer deep in that part of the cave. Rich decided to go down a tight passage, and right as he was about to turn back, he heard a cry for help. He went deeper into that passage and onto the other side, and sure enough, Gary was there. He was in a bowl-shaped room about 10 feet wide, not much more than 3 feet high. Along the left side near the top was a ledge, and above that was a hollowed out area in the ceiling. With his head thrust upward, Gary was huddled onto the ledge and could not move. He was absolutely exhausted from fighting for his life. Matt and Rich grabbed Gary and brought him to an alternate entrance of the cave and took him out because that was quicker than going in from where they came in originally. Not long afterwards, rescuers found the bodies of the two counselors 300 feet further along that same offshoot of the cave that Gary was in. It is suspected that these were the two bodies that were bumping up against Gary the day before. Gary then knew that out of all of the friends and the counselors, he was the only one to survive. Authorities said that they thought the other group members had been swept away and out of the cave down the Mississippi River. Rescuers hunted along the path of the water until about 10 p.m. Everyone else who entered the cave besides Gary was presumed dead, and the rescue efforts were then halted for the night. The next day, the rescuers continued searching the cave. By this point, the water had receded, and they discovered the bodies of Gary's other friends tied in a knot near the cave entrance. Gary's mom said that the fact that Gary was rescued proves that miracles do happen. 
Gary moved back in with his mom and he was like a whole new person with a new appreciation for life. The deaths were the most significant human tragedy in seven weeks of flooding throughout the Midwest, where the death toll had climbed to 41. Crop and property damage stood at more than $10 billion and more than 30,000 people were homeless. The weather forecast was still more heavy rain, as much as six inches in some places. I just want to say thank you for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be nice to the like button. I would really appreciate it. And I also have other disaster videos on the channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.